all on behalf of COE CIPIX IIT Madras. I'd like to extend my special warm welcome to Professor uh, Shankar Kumar Selvaraja. He is a professor in IIC Bangalore, India. So, Professor uh, Selvaraja will give a presentation on uh, silicon photonics based uh, communication and sensor technology. So, before having this uh, interesting topic, I will request uh, Professor Vijay Krishna Das to introduce our honorable speaker. I'll also request uh, uh, Dr. Sudarshan Srinivasan to moderate our Q&A session. Professor Das, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Dipta Sri. Uh, so, once again, uh, we are really grateful to uh, Sankar uh, for agreeing uh, to give a talk in our uh, webinar series. And uh, I think uh, he is already well known uh, among uh, uh, photonics community in India. But uh, for the sake of completeness, uh, I would like to introduce him. Uh, Sankar actually is a professor, Ramakrishna Rao Chair Associate Professor at the Center for uh, Nanoscience and Engineering at IIC Bangalore. And he is also the chair of the National Nano Fabrication Center at ISC. So before joining in ISC in 2014, uh, he was with IMEC Belgium and uh, he is an, uh, also and he received his PhD for his work on wafer scale silicon photonic integrated circuit, particularly process development uh, in Ghent University IMEC Belgium together. Uh, also, he is an, before that, he, he, he was an uh, alma mater of uh, Bharatiya University, Sir Tamil Nadu and College of uh, Engineering, Gindi, and University of Twente, uh, the Netherlands. He spent more than 18 years in developing silicon-based technology, particularly photonic integrated circuit development, process development, and uh, he is having uh, more than 250 research papers and uh, all our international journal, reported journals and conferences. And he also received a DST Sir uh, Early Career Research Award, Visveswaraya Young Faculty Research Fellowship. And uh, currently his research actually involves in uh, uh, photonic integrator circuit, uh, particularly for high speed connectivity, connectivity technology, and uh, uh, sensor technology, neuromorphic and quantum uh, photonic computations. So uh, based on his expertise and uh, it is, his talk is actually well uh, drafted. Uh, uh, his topic now is silicon photonic enabled communication, computing and sensor technology. So uh, he's having a lot of experience we can see you can see, uh, I, I personally know, I know him uh, since 2006 when he was doing PhD, I visited IMEC and that time he actually showed me entire IMEC together with Bim Bogars and uh, he's, uh, he's been a long time associated with us also and it is really, I, we are looking forward uh, to enjoy his talk. I think all of you will be enjoying and I encourage you to put up your uh, question in, in, in Q&A box. In the panel, we have uh, Dr. Sudarshan and Srinivasan. He is also very, he is expert also in photonic integrated circuits. And uh, we have our chief technology officer, Arnok is there also, Dipta Sri is there. So uh, any questions you uh, ask, uh, all of them will uh, help you out to get your uh, answer. With this, I just welcome Sankar, please. Uh, it is your space now, Sankar, please. All right. Thank you very much, Binoy, uh, for this very nice, kind introduction. Um, I, I think uh, I, I should first thank you for, you know, uh, uh, giving this platform for us to share what we have been doing so far. And uh, also congratulations uh, uh, to, to the organizers in, in doing this very nice monthly series, right? Uh, uh, I, I do keep following, you know, who is going to be there next month and what is the topic. So it has created uh, 
you know, interest in the community, right? If someone is going to do, probably you should have some kind of poll, right? <laughs> that who, who, you know, what we are missing and, you know, uh, the viewers can ask, right? So thank you very much again, right, um, for this platform. And um, I will try to keep things, uh, you know, uh, discreet, but uh, still I would like to uh, cover uh, for a wider audience. Um, so without wasting time, let's start. Uh, and uh, as Vijay mentioned, uh, we would like this to be uh, 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 an interactive and, uh, you know, we want you guys to participate. Uh, so please do, um, you know, share your uh, questions uh, that uh, Sudarshanan is going to stop me uh, if there are a large number of questions and then we will take it from there. All right. So I hope the screen is visible. Yes. Yes. Please go ahead. Yeah. Excellent. Thank Absolutely. you very much. Um, so, so as Bhujan mentioned, the title is going to be um, Silicon Photonics Enabled Calm Compute and Sensor Technology. Um, so for, for a while I was thinking, what should I talk on? But then I thought maybe I'll leave it at a reasonably higher level. Uh, yet we would like to, um, you know, showcase what we can do um, uh, with the technology that we have at our disposal, right? So uh, most of the the participants, I believe, are uh, from 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 the country. So there are, uh, you know, resources that we have and how we can use that. And with those resources, what we can demonstrate and what we have been doing so far in these three verticals. All right. Um, I don't have to really uh, tell you much about integration, right? So uh, photonic integrated circuits um, are, are, are making waves, right? Uh, finding applications in, in various avenues. Um, uh, but integration is the solution for, for, for future, right? Um, so things that are coming together that once start that cannot be put together, right? So the whole power of integration come, you know, comes with this added functionality and personal performance enhancement. The whole idea is to take all these discrete and perhaps thin film technology or thin film uh, substrate, but put it together on a single, you know, uh, uh, chip or a substrate, right? So that's that's a power of integration. So you want to do this continuously. Right? So that's what uh, CMOS did from a discrete transistors to a complex circuits. But now instead of complex circuits, we are putting systems together, right? And um, I, I, I strongly believe photonic ICs are going to go through such a revolution, right? Uh, we started with silicon photonics as a, uh, a single material platform, but later on I will, I will, I'll make a case that that's not going to be the case and we won't be innovative if we are going to just stick on to a single material or a single technology platform. So uh, what do we have in the toolbox, right? Whenever you talk about integration, right? What are all the discrete things or functionalities we want to took, uh, take it forward. Um, basically this is, you know, roughly speaking, what you have as functionality, right? You can go into the details, right? Uh, but roughly speaking from the higher level, this is what we have, right? So how do you couple the light in and out, whether we have light source, and how do you route light, right? So I just said waveguide. Perhaps I should rename it in the, in the next talk to routing, right? So routing is a, is, a, is a very challenging thing. It's not just guiding the light, but routing it, right? Uh, wherever you want. And uh, wavelength filters, um, how are we going to discriminate and combine wavelengths? And how are we going to change the property of, of light using light modulators? And finally, you want to detect light on chips. So, all these are very basic functionality, right? So how am I going to put all these together, right? And uh, more often, uh, a single material platform uh, won't be able to uh, demonstrate all these functionalities, right? A good example is light source and a detector, right? Um, with light modulator. So there are platforms that can, you know, do all three. However, if you take silicon, that's not the case, right? So uh, give and take, depending on what you want to do, some of these blocks could be used and some of these blocks could be left to discrete components. So um, this is the motivation for integration, right? Uh, 
you can have large number of functional components uh, onto a single substrate, right? And uh, the whole idea of doing that is I don't need multiple uh, discrete components, so I become very power efficient, both in terms of optical, but also if I'm going to do any electro optic or you know uh, thermo optic, I become very uh, efficient because things are smaller now, so I can make things faster, right, at scale. And that will lead to larger bandwidth if you are talking about electro optics, right? And you can also have broad spectral range if you are talking about, you know, wavelength uh, uh, bandwidth, right? And as I mentioned, you can make it, you know, smaller, lightweight. All these advantages comes along. Uh, but then there is another uh, key advantage in this, you know, uh, putting the light or caging the light into into the small volume. So what you can do is. You can increase the light matter interaction, which is the essence, uh, you know, of, of, of creating a highly sensitive uh, sensor platforms, right? So optical sensors rely on high light matter interaction, right? So the current day uh, technology, if you look at it, the primary bottleneck is inability to increase the interaction volume, right? Including Raman, right? Raman spectroscopy is regularly used as a characterization tool. But we know Raman is very, very weak, and that's why you need this huge high power lasers and all kind of optics in order to extract that signal. But, you know, making the circuits smaller, confined, then you can have really large light matter interaction that would result in, you know, better sensitivity, which I will also flash in one of the slides. So, you know, this is, this is the background. And what do we do here at, uh, at Sense? So, uh, so we have a group of uh, young researchers uh, in, in the group looking at these primarily these three verticals, right? So we have you know visible um, uh, range near IR and also mid IR, right? So these are all three verticals that we work on. Um, and interestingly, these three verticals uh, you know fits into this three application space, right? So visible light and you know uh, near IR to some extent uh, is, is largely used by light by life sciences people, right? So there are a lot of interesting bioimaging sensing uh, that we do, including Raman. Um, and communication sits, you know, shortwave AR and near AR range where we can do communication and all kind of processing on chip. And then mid AR uh, is, 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 is a key uh, if you want to do uh, interesting uh, sensing, primarily uh, gas sensing, environmental sensing, and so on, right? So we uh, we do um, uh, start from material development, device development with that material, and build circuits around it. At the end, you know, system as well. So we we are we are we would like to be vertically integrated. So we just don't do devices or circuits, right? So if we want to have certain application in one of these verticals. Uh, we look around for material. If there are no material platform, uh, we try to look for suitable material, right? Uh, work with uh, uh, material scientists uh, that we know who are our neighbors and take it from there. All right. So that's the philosophy that we broadly follow in my team. And this is actually a team. The team has changed a little bit. Um, few people are uh, new people have joined and few have left, but largely, you know, this is the size of the group. And whatever I'm presenting, it's all from you know, these young researchers that, that I have in my team that put this all together, all right? Thanks to them. Um, so let us dive in, okay? So I don't have to, you know, preach about silicon photonics, right? Um, and you guys probably now believe that silicon photonics is, is, is the technology that's going, it's already, uh, you know, create, creating a reasonable impact in, in various domain, but that comes from, you know, the, the, the platform that we have been created, we have been, uh, you know, uh, leveraging uh, from this uh, CMOS development, right? Uh, so it can it can be used in multiple places, as I said, for connectivity, for communication, right? Short, long, and also for sensing, right? Uh, but there is a huge uh, challenge here, right? Uh, those silicon photonics is, is being considered a disruptive technology. Uh, it's migrating from research labs to industry and scaling up now, right? So what next, right? Uh, so that's where we need to look at what silicon can't do and where is the gap and how can we fill up that gap, right? So 
So silicon is a great material, but it has some serious limitations, right? Uh, we have been turning away from these limitations for a while uh, because there was wealth of things that we were able to demonstrate with these limitations. But then <clears throat> once we you know, solve these problems, then you are hitting uh, the wall that you think, okay, perhaps now is the time to bore a hole uh, into the wall and then look through the wall, right? So one uh, primary, uh, you know, uh, 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 limitation that I see is limitation the wavelength that you can use, right? Silicon, of course, bandwidth, uh, you know, band gap limited, right? Uh, but at the same time, the substrate limitation is also there. So whenever we talk about silicon photonics, we talk about silicon on insulator, right? Uh, though silicon is transparent till about eight micron or so, silicon on insulator is only, you know, transparent till three and a half or so. That's coming from oxide, not silicon. At the lower end, oxide is transparent, but silicon has a uh, band gap limitation, right? So Silicon as a material is good in a certain wavelength band, but perhaps not in the visible and longer wavelength. So there is a restriction there. And non-linearities, when I say non-linearity, we, we exploit non-linearities, but sometimes it becomes undesirable, right? So you don't want something that you can't exploit at the end, right? It, it's purely a limitation. And most of the time, or all the time, when we do, when we talk about electro optics in silicon, we are talking about carrier dependent process. And that is related to loss, right? Because if you want to have a phase change, you 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 come, you you get loss for free. Right? You don't want that, but you it comes along with you know the phase modulation that you want. You cannot have a pure phase modulator uh, to a large extent. Right? Uh, and low temperature limitation, there are there are interesting applications of silicon photonics in uh, in low temperature, uh, you know, quantum uh, technology. But then, silicon uh, the silicon electro optic modulators are of no use when you go to low temperature, right? So that there are some hard limitations, right? And uh, you can go to other kind of tuning techniques that you can use for thermo optic and so on, uh, but they are reasonably slow and uh, inefficient uh, ways of doing it. So. The bottom line here is um, silicon is great, but we can make it even greater uh, if you add things to it, right? So we need to adapt the process, adapt the material technology in order to extend this platform, right? So how, how can we do that, right? So <clears throat> we can still stay within the CMOS, you know, umbrella, right? Let's not, you know, create little ripples that, you know, your your foundry is going to throw you out or your fab is going to throw you out because you are bringing in some crazy material, right? So you still can have silicon oxynitride, silicon nitride type of material, which is not new to us, right? So people have been working with uh, uh, oxynitride and nitride for, 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 for years now, right? There are very good technology demonstration, device demonstration uh, without the certain disadvantages the silicon has. However, these two are dielectric in nature, right? So it is very difficult to get electro optic effects, uh, you know, induced in these material. Um, if that is the case, then you go for integration of material system, right? Uh, not just, you know, uh, waveguide platform, but you look for ferroelectric material, for example, bring it on to silicon, physioelectric material, chalcogenides, right? Um, so these are all the materials that are optically interesting for us. Uh, but as, as, as just as a waveguide, it might be too much work because we already have a platform that is well uh, characterized, uh, both in terms of device development and material. Why don't we bring on these materials wherever we need, right? So that is something we could do. And on the system side, what we can do is, is it possible for us to bring in, you know, MEMS, NEMS technology with silicon, right? Or superconducting circuits, for example, on the silicon, right? So evolution is very important so we we are not going to just you know go on with just silicon as a platform we need to make it even more potent right by creating um, either heterogeneous integration or even monolithic integration of some of these materials right uh, so at the end of the day you you, you may you know end up with just silicon as a substrate for example uh, lithium niobate on insulator platform uses silicon 
substrate, right? But everything happens in lithium now, but similarly, uh, silicon carbide, right? Uh, so those are all upcoming technology of a new platform. However, silicon is, is primarily the base. So there, there are things trying, uh, I mean, we had initially a lot of, uh, you know, trying out uh, was done and then we converged on something. I think now we are in a phase where uh, people are trying to, you know, uh, muddle up a little bit and then see which one is going to be more important in terms of integration and functionality. So that's where we are. And uh, uh, and that's that's my base in, 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 in our take in this uh, silicon technology going forward, right? Uh, so in the next part of the talk, already 15 minutes into the talk right now, I would like to look at some of these functional elements uh, uh, that are interesting and how we were able to manage to demonstrate some of the interesting uh, results that may also interest you. Uh, the first thing is light chip coupling. Right? Um, I, I like this topic because it's it's also a very difficult uh, problem uh, for PICs. Right? Uh, the major problem is coming from the size. We you know beat uh, uh, about this very small size and. You know, the, the, the mode volumes are very small and so on. But at the end of the day, the external interface to the world is to uh, through this optical fiber, right? So this is actually to scale, okay? So this is to scale. Look at it, right? Uh, even back of the envelope calculation will tell you that the, the, the coupling efficiency here uh, is, you know, our loss here is uh, 30 minus 30 dB, right? So nothing goes through, all right? So very poor coupling, right? And the way to couple this, we all um, all know, right? So how do you couple from a larger opening to a, a smaller opening, right? By using a funnel, right? So you can use a funneling technique in order to couple uh, energy from, you know, larger aperture to a, a smaller uh, aperture, right? So we should be able to uh, do that. But then this is more symbolic, right? Uh, you want to look at, look, look at this from, uh, problem from uh, from a, a photonic uh, engineering perspective right and this is uh, two you know uh, regular ways of doing it one is uh, access to uh, the side uh, side of the chip where you come in with a, a lens fiber or a, a bare fiber uh, lens fiber works better because your mode field dia is already reduced and then uh, you can use inverted tapers which is again a kind of a, a funnel, and then you channel the light in, right? So this is, you know, very straightforward. Uh, but as as engineers, we always try to, you know, make things a little bit complicated, uh, and that's where the surface grating comes, right? Let's not uh, let's not think about this trivial way of aligning two elements, and then the, the energy can be transferred, right? So let's look at something orthogonal, right? Uh, so here, the, the the surface gratings are going to help you. To channel the light um, from out of plane to in plane propagation, right? So there are a lot of advantages and uh, challenges here. Um, as I mentioned on the left side, where you see uh, the efficiencies can be reasonably high. There is a very large optical uh, bandwidth and polarization insensitive uh, as well. However, the alignment and uh, end facet preparation becomes, you know, really a struggle, right? So none of my students they want to do this end face polishing. Because it takes forever and it's they are never happy with it, right? And on the right side, but though there are technologies that can you know give you that, but in the in the laboratory setup, it's going to be very difficult to get that uh, as a regular uh, turnaround uh, uh, technology. So surface gratings are, are, are very alignment tolerant, right? These are a large uh, area device like 10 by 10 micron, uh, very easy to fabricate. And we can do vapor scale testing, right? I don't need access to the sidewall anymore. I can just take a, a chip and then I can probe wherever I want. However, the challenge here is to get the efficiency, right? As I said, uh, uh, the edge coupling, you can actually get uh, coupling efficiencies as high as 80 to 90 percentage. People have done that. But on the right side, the, the grating couplers, uh, efficiencies are still uh, challenging, though people have simulated efficiencies are about 90 percentage right the actual uh, production efficiencies can be you know not more than 70 percentage but still it's lot of uh, power going through and the bandwidth limitation is also always there because of the 
creating right period any periodic structure is bandwidth limited right and uh, how does they work um, they, they 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 work with this simple you know a grading equation or a grading phase matching that you do um, so the gaussian light comes in and this grating is designed for a certain period so how are we designing this period by looking at the group index of light that is propagating through this waveguide uh, with the refractive index of the, 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 the superstate or the, the, the substrate that you superstate meaning the, uh, the material that you have on the top and the angle of incident right so you can design this and then if you can look at this in the k space right so you can find uh, phase matching with this diffraction orders that will allow me to couple the light all right so that's quick funda all right uh, so the the problem here is uh, this is a symmetric structure, right? I mean, slightly asymmetric, but, you know, uh, bear with me, but this, this can be made symmetric. Uh, so that means light will go up and also down, okay? And there will be slight leakage as well, which we need to control. So uh, vertically up, I can collect it. Something will go uh, down as well to the bottom, right? And there, uh, some will be reflected back uh, from, the, from the interface and some you will lose it, okay? That is the loss that you have. So this is a very basic uh, grating coupler. So what you see on the right side is a is a fabricated grating coupler, right? This is top down, right? So top down image, and this is actually the grating, the corrugation that you see. So you curve it in such a way that you can actually focus uh, the light that is falling on top, right, to this waveguide that we have, right? So we can do that, and there is a lot of design involved in getting this. Uh, you know couplers uh, to a certain curvature and so on and based on this focal length and uh, and optimizing everything uh, we were able to achieve uh, you know about 3.6 db per coupler and this is better than you know uh, some of the standard uh, mpw or pdks that are available right and we use this as a standard in our uh, lab uh, and there is a review that that we have written a while ago if you want to go and have a look at the design procedures and so on, you can do that. So how can we improve it? I mean, 3.6 dB is not, not great, right? Um, you want to improve it, right? So the challenge here, as I mentioned, is the more engineering and substrate engineering because the more that is coming out, uh, I just quickly pass through it. If you look at this green curve, right? So the green curve is actually the scattered electric field, right? the average electric field that you see here. It's actually not a Gaussian, so it's exponentially decaying, right? So the, 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 the mode that I have from the fiber is actually a Gaussian mode. So if I overlap these two, right, I'm not going to get um, a very good overlap integral. So I need to have this proper mode matching, the Gaussian to Gaussian, right, by engineering the, the grating itself. You can see the, the, the pitch or the period is, is varied from, you know, left side to right side, right? So the strength of the grating is changed, right? That will result in a Gaussian uh, type um, uh, uh, diffraction. And whatever goes down, right? I'm going to put a mirror and reflect all out, right? And these are all the two ways of, you know, making sure I can get the maximum uh, efficiencies through uh, directionality and mode profiling, right? And uh, we were able to do that. And what you see here is uh, uh, is something like that, right? Um, but the, uh, the, the the problem here is, as I mentioned, silicon on insulator platform as a wafer, right? You cannot change the uh, the bottom, right? Uh, the, the substrate is fixed. So here we use silicon nitride, okay? So silicon nitride, you can deposit uh, as a waveguide layer, right? And this is uh, silicon dioxide. And this is actually the Bragg mirror, right? This is silicon dioxide and silicon uh, Bragg mirror, right? So whatever light goes through will be reflected back, right? Into the grating and it will be coupled. And as you can see here, the trenches are narrower here and here they are broader, right? So this is the chipping that we make. And with that, we were able to get coupling efficiencies uh, as low as 1.2 dB per coupler, right? And this is actually state of the art at this point of time for this particular configuration, right? And you can see reasonably, uh, you know, uh, smooth uh, uh, profiles, right? So the dark ones are the fit, 
uh, the oscillating ones are from the measurement, but these oscillations are coming from the cavity. You can see here, uh, this waveguide actually makes a cavity, right? It's a large cavity. If you do the calculation, you will know that this beating is from this cavity. All right. So now we are able to couple the light in, right? So we know how to efficiently, efficiently couple the light in. So the next thing is uh, how can we modulate the light, right? So change the properties of the light, uh, phase and, uh, and, uh, and intensity primarily, okay? So uh, we take silicon diode as a, as a simple device, right? Um, we all have studied simple PN junction diodes, right? Uh, the interesting thing is I make a PN diode, right? And then make the light propagate, right? <coughs> along the junction, right? So that is what you see here. So this is a waveguide, right? And uh, the, the junctions are mentioned here, right? And uh, I, can, I, I can make the light sit here as a waveguide, right? So this is, this is my uh, uh, intensity of the light that is sitting here. And this is going to interact with the junction, right? So what can I do? I can apply a voltage to the junction to push the charges and pull the charges, right? So what is the effect of this charge, right? This charge that I'm going to push and pull is directly proportional to the refractive index of the material, okay? So the charge density dictates your refractive index, which is something that we have studied in our basic uh, uh, solid state physics, right? So if I change that, the refractive index changes. So the phase of the light going through uh, the, the waveguide will change, right? But as I said, this is silicon, right? Everything is related to charge. The charges are also going to contribute to absorption, right? So it will eventually come with absorption loss, right? So there will be a phase change, but the intensity of the light is also going to reduce, okay? So that is the fundamental idea here. So we make this junction uh, in a ring configuration. We make a PN ring. And uh, this is this is something that we uh, we have done using uh, you know uh, an MPW uh, commercial MPW run and you can see here when I change the voltage bias voltage the spectrum shifts and you should quickly note that the extension is also reducing I told you right the uh, the movement of your uh, uh, wavelength right or the resonance is because of the refractive index change, but the extinction change is coming from the absorption loss that we have, right? So you cannot, you know, avoid this in silicon. And uh, we were able to get 25 gigahertz operation here. So you can put this on and off. So you can get the light modulated at these speeds, right? And what are we limited here with, right? So basically it's, it's, it's uh, RC limited here, right? Um, you have the capacitance from the junction with your uh, resistance along the, 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 the contact path, right? So one can engineer this in order to get better, uh, uh, you know, speeds, right? And uh, that is something that we have done uh, uh, where we were able to, you know, get this uh, design, right, uh, of having offset, uh, uh, you know, junction, right? Um, along with PN and PIN configuration, right? So we want to have PN junction and we want to have the junction offsetted and we also want PIN uh, junction here, okay? Because these three have their own advantages and disadvantages, right? One is faster, but they, it absorbs a lot. The other is slower, but you will get larger, you know, extinction. So. We tried to look at this configuration. We came up with this kind of very oval, you know, uh, 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 doping profile, right? And where we were able to design this uh, within the PDK limitation. And we have, you know, devices that are over 45 gigahertz bandwidth, okay? So this is really amazing, uh, you know, result. And uh, we are trying to see uh, how much we can push this, right? At the end of the day, the external, um, transients are going to dictate, but the intrinsic devices are much, much faster. 
so that is from external uh, foundry, right? Uh, but what can we do with the available technology here in our lab? Think in, uh, in your lab, you might have a furnace, a simple, you know, thermal furnace, right? You can also dope silicon with a, with a temperature that can, you know, go till about 800 or so, right? So you simply dope silicon and it will become electrically active, right? And that's what we have done here. So we took a very simple, uh, you know, uh, this kind of uh, shallow edged waveguides. And uh, we did PN junction, but by using diffusion uh, doping method, right? So thermal diffusion doping, you can see here the temperatures are given where you can see, <clears throat> you know, the absorption loss because of these uh, dopants that are coming closer to, uh, I'll, I'll just put it there, yeah. So this is the doping window that you see, right? And the dopants are going to actually do this, right? So they are going to, uh, migrate into the silicon ring that we have, right? So based on the offset, right, you can see uh, the extinction actually goes down. Higher extinction means the light is still circulating. The extinction is killed because uh, the dopants are just absorbing, okay? So with this analysis, right, where I should keep my junction, right, so that I don't lose the, the light because of absorption, because this is where the light is sitting. And this is my junction, right? Or rather the doping, uh, doped region. I don't want these regions to come in very close because they are going to absorb my light. And based on this, you know, calculation and experiment, uh, we were able to demonstrate, uh, you know, diffusion doped device with VPI L, you know, as small as 0.3 volt centimeters, right? This is really amazing uh, result because we did not, you know, we thought it's going to be very difficult to get, you know, uh, uh, these process going on. Uh, the PhD student has spent uh, quite a lot of time in understanding this process. And finally, we were able to just get this working. The only problem here is this might not be very fast. Okay, so they, they can work at some megahertz, uh, but they will make a very efficient phase shifters. So that is all about silicon, okay? So we can do all these jugglery in order to get silicon do the job for you for light modulation, right? Uh, but what is going to be beyond silicon, right? So that is the question you want to answer, right? So what is next? Silicon is done and dusted, what is next, right? So in terms of, uh, you know, light modulation as a, as, as a, as a process, as, as a function, right? You can get it done through a couple of uh, means, right? So one is the regular electro-optic process that we all, you know, uh, read in our uh, basic optics course, which is popples, right? Which is materially uh, dictated uh, process. Uh, you can use carrier dependent processes as well, right? So that we just saw. We can't use, uh, uh, you know, popples in, in, in silicon because of the, 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 crisp, the, the nature of the crystal itself, right? So to invoke pockles, you need to have non centrosymmetry right? The, the material should be polarizable. I will just, you know, talk about it in the next slide. Just bear with me. Um, and those are all the processes that we could use, right? So we, we looked at this carrier dependent or carrier density effect or carrier dispersion effect in silicon. However, the lithium niobate that we <clears throat> use off the shelf, right? Uh, that, is, that, that all depends on pockles, right? So pure electro-optic, right? No uh, absorption at all. Pure phase modulation is possible, right? And the material system that one can look at, right, is uh, lithium niobate uh, or barium titanate or PZT. Why am I talking about these three? And that leads me to the, the bottom part here, there, right? So if you look at this material with their uh, electro-optic efficiency, right, this is the R coefficient we talk about. How many picometers per volt material can respond, right? This is the three, three coefficient, right? So silicon is is zero essentially, but if you strain it, right, you can you can apply a strain. This is the famous paper from DTU, you know, 2014, 13, where they showed that you can actually make uh, strained silicon do electro optics, right, without doping. Uh, but it's very poor, right? Lithium niobate, look at that, right? 33 picometer per volt. I mean, right now, lithium niobate is the star, right? But look at the other material system, PZT, right? Lead zirconium titanate and uh, barium titanate, right? So 
these these are all materials that are you know reasonably well established and people have understood for other applications right so looking at this we thought okay why don't we explore uh, these interesting material platforms and and see what they can do for us and again you know if you look at this whole speed and energy and so on i think focus is going to be reasonably you know uh, uh, power efficient and speed as well right compared to carrier uh, effects so how do how do they work right so i, I promised you I will, I will just touch base on on this non central symmetric uh, effect right so if you take a crystal right any uh, crystal you say you you have these atoms that are that are arranged uh, in a certain way uh, and they don't move right they are very symmetric in whichever direction you you apply electric field all these atoms are going to e e experience the same field and nothing happens however if you are going to have a, a material system uh, in particularly in this barium titanate lithium niobate kind of uh, 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 material this titanium atom <coughs> which sits at the body center right it's not actually sitting at the center there it is slightly displaced because of the polarization and this displacement right gives you opportunity to polarize the material when there is an electric field applied now based on the orientation of the electric field right your material is index is going to change okay so that gives you a lot of opportunity here so this is not anymore a, a simple dumb material but i can change its property by applying an electric field and what you see on the right side is the hysteresis right whenever i apply a field the polarizability or polarization changes or you know you, you can call it as polarization and if you are an optics person you can use that as a light polarization change right it will always track this hysteresis right and there is an amount of field that is required in order to align all these you know domains what we call right you know one single direction you see it's all pointing towards one direction based on the electric field in between they can be you know uh, uh, pointing to different direction right the, the polarization or the electric field within these domains so if we can align them all then effectively you are changing the polarization from point b to point e all right so this gives you a lot of uh, opportunity here to play with the material refractive index right so basically pockets effect is, is is creating this uh, uh, refractive index change right uh, by refringence between uh, the uh, orientation or the optical axis that you are interested in so that is the, the, the base uh, basic idea right uh, and as i mentioned we were interested in two type of two material uh, pizza t that is uh, lead zirconium uh, titanate uh, so you know unlike the mems people who are also using pizza t we chose to use sputter deposition okay um, and interestingly we were able to demonstrate hysteresis with sputter deposited lead zirconium titanate right and we were able to get this hysteresis and what you call the butterfly curve uh, because of the remanence capacitance right so if it is uh, if it is not going to store any charges you will see a single curve right the capacitance is not going to change but forward and backward cycling will create this butterfly because of the storage of these charges right and we were we, we compared the uh, pzt target the sputter target with the material we deposited and you can see here very nice overlap of these peaks okay and this is thin film uh, by the way and we were able to do it for lateral measurement of these uh, electro optic effect as well so once the material looked interesting uh, the next thing uh, we, we wanted to do in this case uh, Suraj, uh, who is a PhD student, uh, was excited to do, okay, let's put it on our ring and then let's measure what happens, all right? So this is what you see, right? So we took a simple waveguide and uh, we had this buffer layer that we need to grow, right? And post that buffer layer, we deposit PZT of tea and it goes through some, you know, thermal cycling, right? And this is a very simple ring and we have this uh, PZT of tea patch with electrodes and we applied voltage, right? And uh, when you are when you are applying this voltage, you can see here as I increase the voltage, right? It keeps moving, uh, you know, uh, towards red. Okay, so there is a red shift that that you see. And actually, what is happening here is 
all the domains that I, I was talking about, right? They are pointing in all different directions, right? So when I apply this huge voltage, right? 20, 30, 40 voltages, right? All these domains are aligning to each other, right? So let me go back to that uh, cartoon. Yeah, this is what I'm referring to, right? So when you are starting here, right? All these domains are random in nature, right? So these domains are random in nature, but when I keep increasing my voltage, they start aligning, right? They start aligning and this alignment gives me effective refractive index change. And that is the reason why I see a red shift, right? And this process is called polling, right? This the process of aligning all the domains in one direction is called polling, right? And once I polled it, right? So now I come back and then apply a lower voltage, right? Now the voltage is between zero to 12 volts, right? And you can see here, I see blue shift, right? Which is classic, uh, electro optic. I don't know why it keeps going back. And forth. It's a classic electro optic, uh, uh, you know, demonstration, right? So we were able to do, uh, you know, blue shift with applied voltage. So that means it's not thermal, right? Uh, there is no current flowing through this, right? That is very important to uh, make sure that there is no current flowing through it. And even if the current is flowing through it, it's, it's not generating the heat to, uh, uh, you know, to show um, uh, redshift, okay? So we got about 12 picometer per volt. Uh, we initially, we were, you know, reasonably happy with this uh, demonstration because, you know, you, you, you got the blue shift and you got 12 picometer per volt. 12 picometer per volt is just a number, but we need to work on the material to uh, system to make it better because this can deliver better. The reason why we are interested in PZT is this is not just electro-optic, I can also make it piezoelectric. So I can integrate, you know, uh, electro-opto-mechanical system, right, on a, on, a, on a single platform, right? This need not be silicon, this can be nitride, any platform of your choice. So the next material system that, that I, I, I told you we were interested in is, is barium titanate, right? Uh, this is again all on silicon. Huh? I mean, we are not changing the platform. We are taking silicon and we deposit uh, barium titanate using pulse laser deposition. Um, so we are not experts in uh, barium titanate while the sputter deposition was done by us. So this, we are taking help from, you know, uh, Vasu, uh, uh, who is a material scientist, right? And here we were able to get a decent butterfly. So you can see here, it's not perfect, right? We were able to see a butterfly here. A uh, lot of engineering involved, material engineering involved. Uh, just to give you uh, some perspective, uh, barium titanate on silicon uh, was demonstrated by, uh, you know, uh, Stefan Abel's group a while ago, but uh, the technology uh, they are using is, uh, is uh, molecular beam epitaxy. It's a, it's absolutely, uh, you know, manufacturable large area technique, right? Um, but very difficult to, to control and handle, right? It's very substrate dependent. Um, pulse laser deposition on the other hand can be done on multiple substrates, right? The material quality uh, is something that is debatable, right? However, we are, we, we think we know uh, the, the secret sauce here to push this uh, to the level that we think uh, is, is, is readily adaptable uh, for, uh, for, for use as an electro-optic uh, material here, right? So uh, how do you know that this material is electro-optic, right? Uh, whether there, there is polarization. However, CV measurement here shows, you know, hysteresis, right? Uh, uh, split uh, butterfly here. However, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an optical engineer, you want to look at, you know, whether uh, the material is optically, uh, you know, active as well. So we did second harmonic, right? Uh, this is the, this is from Varun's lab here. So uh, we, we used his setup to look at SSG generation and we got slope of 2.06, which is very good. And more interestingly, this is what makes it uh, you know, very, very interesting and also, you know, helping us to move forward, right? So this is actually a polarization curve that you call, uh, that, you, that you record, right? So if the material is isotropic, right, then you will see a circle, okay? 
okay that means the polarization or rather the input polarization and the output polarization will exactly be the same right you will not have any um, uh, any difference in the ssg as a function of input polarization because in this case the material is anisotropic that means it has a preferential polarization the material itself so that's why you see a, a minor axis here and a major axis here so that means the, the material is majorly aligned uh, in 0 to 180 right the vertical alignment is very strong right while there is lateral alignment but the lateral alignment can be tuned by using the pulling method but vertical alignment is, is predominant here right uh, if you compare it with bulk we are you know uh, order lower we expect this because going from a large bulk film to a thin film you are going to lose some uh, 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 some of these uh, efficiencies or these coefficients uh, but we need to live with that but this is already very encouraging and we are pushing this forward to make devices out of it this is just a teaser uh, devices are under process and we do have measurement that shows electro optic uh, modulation with this material so that is so far with, uh, with with all these light modulation right so what can photonics do for computing right so the next generation computing is going to be very different from how we know now right <clears throat> you must have heard about neuromorphic computing in, in different contexts right uh, ml ai and so on but those AI and ML algorithms still run on this uh, regular traditional missions, right? Uh, but we want to move away from that, right? So can we implement, right, uh, photonic neuromorphic uh, architecture, right? So that will make sure that one, they are faster, and two, you know, you can do all the general purpose computing, um, you know, with the components that we right now have. So one of the problems that we have in, in doing this is uh, a memory element, right? When you say in-memory computation, that's what <clears throat> neuromorphic is all about, right? You put the memory and compute together, right? So you don't need bus and so on. But in photonics, realizing uh, memory is uh, is very hard because storing photons are, are very challenging. So how do you create a non-volatile memory, okay? So you can do tuners, right? So, but we want to have a non-volatile memory, right? So one way to achieve that is by using, you know, phase change material, right? So what is this phase change material? Let's have a look at it, right? So again, this is coming from the material side, right? Where you have a certain material that has a, 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 a optical property, right? And uh, it is an insulating phase, let's say. Uh, I can apply, let's say, heat, right? Uh, in this case, uh, you know, uh, a certain uh, temperature, uh, but I, I can also use optical <coughs> trigger, right? And that optical energy or thermal energy is going to change the, you know, phase of the material. It can go from insulating phase to metallic phase, right? So we know what happens when you go from insulating phase to metallic phase, right? So the optical constants are going to change and you can exploit that for your storage, right? This becomes non-volatile, right? I don't have to constantly give energy in order to store that information, right? So I can use optical pulses uh, to, uh, to, to create a certain phase and then I can stay in that phase forever without spending additional energy and that's what you want to do and in this particular case uh, we explored uh, vanadium dioxide which is a very good uh, phase change material used explored for uh, phase change memories right in fact um, and you can see here the delta n right the change in the refractive index is huge right delta n is one right on the other hand you can see here the change in the optical loss is also huge because you're going from insulating phase to metallic. So metallic, we don't like metallic, right? Because light absorbs in a guided wave system, right? However, <clears throat> you can realize some of these, uh, you know, uh, states uh, preparation using this uh, this material. We try to do that by simply taking a ring, right? Uh, you take a ring resonator um, and you put the light in and the light is going to be captured inside this cavity 
based on this uh, phase matching condition. So where R is the radius of the ring and N effective is the effective refractive index of the mode uh, that is propagating within the ring, right? And this N effective depends on the core refractive index, the medium refractive index, the substrate and also your, when I say substrate, the cladding and also your uh, cross section, right? All these are captured here. So now if I change the property of, of, of this, uh, you know, either the medium that uh, the, the ring is seeing, the N effective will be changed. So the moment I change the N effective, the resonant wavelength is also going to change. And that's what you see on the right side, right? So if I change the real part of the refractive index, there is just shift in the peak. But if the, you know, imaginary part or the extinction coefficient is also going to change, if it is greater than zero, right? So you are going to see change in the extinction. You remember, this is something that we discussed in silicon uh, plasma uh, dispersion modulator, like plasma dispersion modulator. So you want to have a material system that can interact with the light where the real part only changes, right? Uh, imaginary part change is lower or absorption is lower. But yet we went through it and then said, okay, uh, we took a silicon uh, waveguide, uh, we deposited oxide, planarized it, and then we deposited uh, vanadium dioxide using pulse laser deposition again. Um, and then we, we did some uh, optical processing in order to make sure that they come to the phase, right? You can see here the real, you know, magic of doing CMP, right? So when you have topography, when you do this very nice CMP, it becomes flat. And then we process this, right? Uh, vanadium dioxide on top of the ring. And this is what the measurement looks like, right? So we did this on this chuck that we have. And you can see here, at different temperatures, right? They are moving, right? It is moving uh, in, uh, in, 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 in higher wavelength. That means there is a red shift. Not just the redshift, but the extension ratio is also reducing. All right. And you can see here very nicely the hysteresis, the heating and cooling cycle, because this material is flexible. You can heat it and cool it. It will go from metallic to insulating and insulating to metallic. So you can do that, right? And that is what we have done. We looked at the extinction change. Uh, very, very happy about that because we were able to produce this optically. Electrically, people are demonstrating it and we were able to do it optically. And using that, we we also did very, you know, a simple switching test. And this is again going to be in few 100 kilohertz only because it is thermally driven process. However, for some of the quantum applications and also, uh, you know, programmable uh, uh, photonic application, uh, you are not looking at very high speeds. Um, uh, you know, there are, there are speeds that can be increased by using other platform, right? Uh, <clears throat> so using that, uh, we, we can do quite a lot, but then, you know, the other important aspect in, in getting this photonic integrated circuits is to have all these functionalities, right? Um, so light integration on chip is a, is a huge challenge, right? Silicon obviously cannot emit light, right? Uh, it is intrinsically challenged. However, we can integrate uh, sources on top of silicon, like, you know, 3.5 can be bonded, right? Sudarshan has done excellent work in that domain. A uh, lot of interesting functionalities, 3.5 and silicon integration. But then we are looking at this problem from a slightly different uh, perspective. We said, okay, why don't we look at, uh, you know, lower wavelength uh, circuits, right? And also look at, you know, unconventional, uh, emitters, for example, quantum dots, right? So it becomes very interesting to see that if you integrate quantum dots on waveguides, the emission becomes much more efficient, right? Because of the Purcell enhancement factor. So you can see here when, when the dipole, you know, sitting normal to the waveguide compared to tangential or parallel, right, to the waveguide, your Purcell enhancement is reasonably high. Okay. So integrating this quantum emitters, right? so we know a lot of quantum dots can be uh, you know, uh, generated or synthesized for different wavelengths and so on, right? So uh, we thought if, if this is the case, why not integrate quantum dots uh, that are operating at, you know, uh, various wavelengths 
uh, and then see what happens, right? And here we use silicon nitride as the waveguide platform because we are working at lower wavelength range and we have made these uh, waveguides to work at, uh, you know, primarily 780 in order to check the propagation losses, right? So silicon nitride, we, we have used different processes to evaluate uh, the absorption properties and you can see uh, various, uh, you know, techniques, right? Plasma enhanced CVD or low pressure CVD based on the, the composition, you get lower or higher loss, right? So the numbers that you see, these were correlated with uh, uh, the ellipsometry or the K measurement from it and very good, uh, you know, agreement uh, is reached there, right? And using this, what we did was we talked to some of our colleagues in physics, uh, got some quantum dots uh, that was emitting, you know, uh, around 500, 600 range. And uh, we took this waveguide and dispersed this quantum dots and we excited it. And, and as expected, right, uh, you will have uh, a large amount, number of quantum dots that are sitting uh, along the waveguides and they were coupling light, right? So the, the quantum dots are sitting here and they are, this is the waveguide, they are coupling in and we were able to collect the light out through the waveguide. And this clearly shows that, you know, you can actually put these quantum dots along the waveguides, excite them and collect the emitted light through these waveguides, right? And we were very excited about it and uh, we are continuing this, you know, uh, light uh, emitters, right? Um, really unconventional uh, emitters onto uh, circuits in order to do this, all right? And that is for the quantum emitters that effort that we are trying to do. And uh, the next thing is the detectors, right? Once you have the source on, why don't, why not realize detectors? And since we are working on the lower wavelength range, silicon nitride along with silicon becomes a very interesting platform, right? So we, we took this SOI, right? And we processed nitride waveguides uh, on top. And then we, we use the SOI silicon as a detector, right? So the cross section looks something like this. So you have a rich waveguide with the junction and we come in with a nitride waveguide on top, right? And what you see is the cross section, right? So, oops. Yeah, so this is the cross section where you see the light is initially sitting here. Uh, lost my pen, sorry about that. Yeah, so the light uh, was initially sitting here and as it progresses, it, it leaks into the silicon layer here, right? And then, uh, sorry, the other way around. And then you, you can detect the photons through this, right? This is top down. And what you see is the cross section, right? Where the light is leaking into silicon photo detector and design is all done to get maximum coupling and so on. And this is just an IV characteristic that shows very good, um, you know, uh, efficiencies here, right? Responsivity of about 0.5 amp per watt, right? With a nano amp dark current. Right? We were very encouraged uh, by this. Uh, with that, we, we processed in a waveguide geometry, right? For this detector and then see what is the time response of this, right? And we were able to get, you know, about 0.4 amp per watt um, as responsivity at the operating bandwidth of 14 gigahertz. Right? It's a reasonably large bandwidth uh, we were able to get. So that means you can have high speed silicon photo detectors integrated on silicon nitride platform now. Um, and then we try to increase the efficiency now. We had this 0.4, but they, it, this was long, okay? We want to make it shorter in order to see how efficiently we can pump in. So we build a cavity. It's a ring cavity. You put a detector inside this cavity and that's what you see here. This is the uh, uh, a waveguide and you have uh, silicon uh, uh, on, on, on the shoulders that are acting as detectors. And we were able to get 0.8 amp per watt, okay? But this is very small. It's only six micrometer long, okay, interaction length. And if you don't do this cavity, it's only 0 0.006 amp per watt, right? We have about, you know, two orders of magnitude improvement in this responsivity because of this cavity effect. Right, and this is also working at seven gigahertz electro optic bandwidth. Right, so uh, detector done, 
the, the emitter integration technology is also underway. Uh, finally, you want to, you know, have some wavelength selectivity, right? I can generate these wavelengths. How do I discriminate these different wavelengths? Right? There we use, um, there are multiple platforms you can use, but this is an HL grating, right? Uh, for some of you, this is still the, the glance angle, you know, uh, uh, diffractive grating that we have studied uh, in our basic optics course, where you have the light coming in and you have this reflective grating and based on uh, the phase accumulation, you are going to get, you know, individual channels, spatially segregated, all right? And this is what happens. And this is actually a, a measured device, okay? Um, so these are all discrete channels uh, that we were able to get. You know, this is in, um, in 1550 band, right? And insertion laws are very good. So you're talking about the sub 2B, sub 1DB insertion law. So we need to give a lot of importance to laws here. So we were able to get this, spectro basically this is a spectrometer on shelf, right? Uh, and then we want to integrate detectors, right? So our germanium detectors are yet to come for 1550 nanometer. So in the meantime, we said we have silicon detectors. Why don't we make this HL at 850 nanometer band, right? And then make this detector integrated, right? And uh, what you see is actually an 850 nanometer captured from a visible camera. So you can see the light coming in and they are all, you know, uh, diffracted. And you can see nicely lighting up, okay? And we were able to measure uh, the, the, the V characteristics of this. And uh, we found that this is one of the smallest, um, you know, uh, spectrometer or HL grating that was demonstrated. So we're pretty happy about that. Uh, so I'll stop here and then ask um, Sudarshan in, because uh, we have already one, our done. So, uh, should we stop here or uh, can I get a uh, five minutes or so? I think you can go ahead. Uh, <laughs> okay. I'm pretty you. sure people are interested to see. Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, um, you know, so far we, we, we discussed about, you know, um, how uh, we can, you know, take advantage of these platforms in building this, this, this discrete functionalities that enable you to, you know, put a, put a complex circuit rate, right? Um, but the same platform can be used for, for sensors as well, right? Uh, so the sensor technology, I would say. So we are using uh, this whole idea of eminent, uh, you know, field in order to detect what is happening, you know, in the environment, right? So if you look at uh, a simple waveguide here, right? So the light is propagating, um, with an evanescent tail here, right? And this trail is constantly interacting with the medium outside, right? Uh, and also underneath the substrate as well, uh, but outside the core, it is interacting, right? Any change in the environment will result in change in the effective refractive index, right? And that is what we are trying to see, right? So when there is a change in the um, uh, the refractive index or the optical constant of the environment, we can either do refractive index sensing, which is purely phase, that only concentration and temperature, or you can have absorption sensing, right? Where K is going to play a role, right? So where you, you see intensity change in the light that is propagating through. So exploiting this, uh, we can do, you know, both index and absorption sensing on, on a single platform. However, it needs a little bit of tweaking, right? So far, we looked at wire-based structures, right? Wire waveguides or, you know, shallow edged waveguides where the light is primarily sitting inside the waveguide. And that's what you need in terms of waveguiding, right? You don't want the light to be, you know, leaking out. However, if you want to do sensing, most of the light should be interacting with the environment, right? So here, these guys are about, you know, 10, 12 uh, percentage only interacting, right? But then if you look at this slot waveguide, right? Um, and this, this came out of, uh, of Cornell Lab where they were able to show, you know, reasonably high electric field confinement between two rays, right? And that is propagating. It's not standing uh, wave where, where the K-vector is, is, is standing, right? So there is, there is no propagating K there. There is only vertical K there. In this case, 
the k is propagating along the rail right so that means the, the wave is propagating and and that allows you to do continuous interaction right along the waveguide with more than 30 percentage interaction only right so that is the interaction that you have and this will actually put the whole sensing into a new regime of sensitivity right and uh, we were able to come up with some ways of exciting this 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 uh this slot mode okay and uh Vikrito came up with this very nice idea of split and combine strategy where you know you can do it lossless all right uh, if everything works perfectly fine uh and we were able to demonstrate that and what you are seeing is a SEM image of that demo demonstrator where we have the input coupler goes through we split it and then we combine and this is the slot right and what you are interested in what is the benefit in doing that and this is the benefit in doing that where a simple wire waveguide has 74 nanometer per refractive index unit sensitivity however a slot waveguide has about 360 nanometer per riu so you can see the benefit in in, in doing this and we have benchmarked this against you know a benchtop refractometer right and you know there is no doubt about you know the difference here i mean this is just we want to show it as a difference but other than that there is perfectly no difference between on check measurement and the refractometer measurement <clears throat> and this is one of the best i don't want to talk about it uh, and we did this in a channel as well right you want to have continuous flow and continuous monitoring right so we integrated this chip in a opto fluidic channel and we started you know measuring uh these chips when where there is a you know flow of fluid that we would like to do and uh, this is the setup uh, that we use to do that measurement right there is a lot of work done by project staff and students here um, and this is what we saw okay as a function of you know uh, i should update the reference here as a function of you know uh, concentration right we were able to see the refractive index change and amazingly this fits very well with the standard abbey refractometer and we can do titrations on chip as well right you can go from you know uh, uh, unoxidized uh, potassium bicarbonate to oxidized state and then come back as well this is all done in a flow channel right you can do that and this is all done by photonic uh, simple photonic sensors right waveguide sensors and the other technology that I would like to briefly mention is uh, integrating uh, PICs with MEMS technology, right? MEMS is really great. I, we all like MEMS for its you know, very, uh, uh, very simplistic view uh, in the engineering. However, they are very difficult to uh, you know, probe. The transduction is very hard, right? Uh, and that's the reason why we use uh, this huge uh, you know Doppler vibrometer to do these measurements right what we want to do is we want to scale it down and put it on a chip right so that is that is what we want to do we have this very nice cantilever mems cantilever and we want to use this uh, pic to do this sensing right and uh, it works with simple you know interference method right we have in coupling we divide the light into three different paths and then one of the optical path is modulated with the cantilever here right and, and that modulates the light that is going out okay so this is a simulated result that you can see as a function of this gap the modulated light gets uh, gets its phase difference right we went through this detailed fabrication process it's not trivial but it's, it's quite a lot of steps very challenging we were able to uh, get these cantilevers stand on top of these waveguides, right? And this is the bottom drive electrode and this is the top drive electrode, right? And we start applying voltages to these uh, drivers and they start vibrating, right? And these are all the resonances that you see, right? Mode one and mode two are optical modes, by the way, right? For us, mode means different, but then they call that mechanical modes, right? And these are all resonating modes and these are all not measured by LDV. This is measured by on-chip LDV or the grading sensors that we call, right? And you can also measure the phase change as well. You can see the phase transition around the 
the resonance, right? And we need to put some metric to it, right? So the metric here is what is the smallest deflection that you can measure, right? And we were able to measure two picometers, right? So that is the uh, minimum displacement uh, we were able to measure, right? And we were able to correlate with, you know, laser Doppler vibrometer, which is the standard, and it absolutely sits on top of each other, right? So there is no difference at all. Uh, we were quite excited with it. So we thought, okay, why don't we integrate piezo mem structures on top? Instead of going through this very heavy fabrication flow, let's make photonic IC and piezo mems IC separately, and then let's integrate it. All right. So now these two technologies are independent, right? Um, and they can evolve on their own, and then we can integrate it. And uh, and this is how it, the cartoon looks. So the bottom part is PIC, and this part is bent, right? And the beam is floating on top of the grating. All right. And this is the the optical image uh, of of it, right? So these are all the electrical drives, and this is the optical probe. Okay. So now for the interesting part, and here again, we were able to see the resonance. And these resonances really match well with, um, with the LDV measurement. So we can even integrate already fabricated MEMS, you know, structure on top of photonic circuit in order to do this measurement. And we can do these measurements even in a chamber, right? So thanks to Akshay here. Um, so they have this very nice chamber where we can put our uh, whole device into the chamber and in vacuum, the quality factor improves, right? Because the damping is lower. So for any mechanical structure, the damping becomes uh, reasonably low uh, or without any damp, you can run these measurements and they become highly, uh, uh, you know, narrow, right? So we were able to do that. And with that, we were able to demonstrate what are all the additional sensor technology that we can come up with, right? We were uh, happy with that. Right, and we are pushing that technology all together. Um, with that, I would like to summarize. Right, uh, I have shown you aspects of you know how versatile uh, the PIC platform is, particularly silicon platform is, right, um, and how you can exploit it for various uh, application space. And uh, the other thing I want to emphasize is we are now is the is, is the technology is moving towards. Um, you know, heterogeneous integration of new materials or even, you know, monolithic integration of different material system onto uh, the same uh, platform, right? And this will enable next generation PICs, right? Um, and, uh, and, and things are, you know, left to us to, to be creative. And one thing that I did not touch today is, you know, on the quantum circuits as well, we can make very interesting proposals for uh, photonic quantum uh, uh, processors both for, uh, for communication and computing applications as well. That is for some other day. So with that, over time of 12 minutes, I stop. <laughs> Thanks again, Sudarshan, for allowing me to go over. But now I think we can discuss and then listen to people question. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm sure uh, we enjoyed, that was my uh, virtual clap. Um, Oh, yeah, <laughs> we are certainly trying to get speakers uh, offline and actually visit our campus, but uh, hopefully that will happen uh, this year or the next. Um, thanks, thanks, uh, Shankar, for that very nice talk. Uh, you've obviously touched on a lot of verticals, a lot of applications and a lot of devices. So congrats to you and your team uh, at IAC. Uh, you've uh, Certainly push the envelope on on some uh, novel uh, integration of materials on silicon. So uh, I have a few questions from the audience. Uh, we can take them in the order they came, and then perhaps move on to some of the questions I have or the panel has. Um, so Yesh asks, um, how are the gratings fabricated? Uh, were they um, a lithography system or an EBL system? Uh, so at least in our case, um, the, the gratings are fabricated using electron beam lithography, um, but that's just basically access to the technology. So um, you can do it with optical lithography because these, let me go to that. 
um, the dimensions that you that you have here um, are, are are not really difficult, right? So at least for silicon, uh, we have we have about you know six thirty uh, nanometer uh, period uh, with fifty percentage duty cycle. So. 350 nanometer can be easily uh, fabricated. However, if you go to lower wavelengths and uh, structure like these, right, uh, where you have what we call chipped or upperized grading, I'll show you that image. Yeah, here you can see uh, these are all reasonably relaxed CDs, but then as you go along, uh, the, the CD becomes very challenging. So we, we have had designs where the CD can go between, you know, 50 to uh, 20 nanometers, okay? So that becomes uh, 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 the minimum CD requirement. Since we are using uh, electron beam lithography, I think these series are uh, accessible to us. However, if you want to do this uh, in, uh, in a projection lithography, then it depends on the node that you're using. 50 to 20 nanometer is, is easily uh, reachable uh, with, with 28 nanometer uh, node, right? So that that, that, that should be okay because right now, uh, you know, this we have done it, you know, in 2013, for, uh, 13, 14, that uh, uh, photonics can benefit much from 183 immersion um, uh, where we were running 22 nanometer node. Okay, so that's a difference. So in this case, we we do EDM. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is from Piyush. So he, his question is, uh, is barium titanate and uh, GST, are they CMOS compatible? So barium titanate and GST, right? These are all the materials that were ex explored for a phase change memory. Uh, okay, PCM technology evolved, uh, you know, looking at these material platforms. And right now for memory, barium titanate is actually seriously considered and explored. So these are CMOS compatible. Okay. And uh, yeah, I think he goes one step further uh, in asking if as the technology matures, um, do you see them replacing thermal heaters once and for all? Uh, I, uh, that's, a, that's a whole idea. Uh, because I, we don't want to, um, you know, spend uh, current anywhere, right? So voltage driven is much better, and I see that as a uh, as a clear possibility moving away from with thermal optic altogether. Yeah. And yeah, you're, you're not consuming power in real time, right? So um, good. Um, the next question is from Ankhan. Uh, his question is on the quantum dot integration on waveguides. Um, do in the experiment that you showed us, uh, do you actually produce deterministic single photons, or <laughs> is it more of okay. a? <laughs> so, a so, <laughs> so that's that, that's where we are we are we are going. Uh, uh, it's interesting that he caught it there. So, uh, so that's that's a whole idea. So um, our, our our collaborators, um, you know, we have a, another vertical looking at, uh, you know, uh, improving um, the brightness and the lifetime um, using textured photonic surfaces, right? Um, uh, along with QDs to to to, to have uh, a decent uh, directionality and so on. But in this case, the the idea is to integrate uh, QDs uh, in such a way that will have um, single photon emitters integrated on waveguides. Right. Um, I guess so that's actually all of the questions. There's a comment from Srikant saying, I think he was a little too eager. Um, he mentions that uh, photonics could actually be, integrated photonics could actually be a good fit with MERS. And I think he probably, uh, witness some of the work that you did there. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think uh, yeah, integrating uh, this heterogeneous system is, is is going to create a new, you know, uh, stream of uh, you know, uh, 
uh, opportunity, I would say, uh, because, you know, now we are talking about uh, MEMS structures integrated with it, right? The two chips and so on. Now we have actually uh, looked at integrating uh, piezoelectric material, right? Uh, along with photonic uh, devices to, to see how we can actually enhance uh, uh, the sensitivity and so on that, that some of these MEMS folks uh, actually suffer. Uh, so we, we are looking in, into that direction. And uh, I think it's an interesting vertical to, to work on. Yeah, I agree too. Um, actually, we have a, a comment that just came in with, with a question. Um, so Sujay says, thank you for the in-depth review on your latest work. Um, but he's not been very specific, so you can probably unmute if you can, Sujay. But he says several slides back, you have shown the waveguides with multiple hundred dB loss. What was that? The ones with P, C, V, D, and other techniques. Ah, yeah. <clears throat> okay, I'm trying to get out of for some reason. Ah, yeah, there it is. There it is. Uh -huh. Yeah. So this is what he was talking about, right? This is this is right. This yeah. So um, I, I I went a little bit quick on this. Um, uh, you know, so this was basically screening the material for uh, for loss, right? Uh, so if if you look at silicon as, as 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 a crystalline material, we know enough. And if it is a crystalline material, uh, it is grown. There are certain you know. Uh, transparency that you expect from it, right? But silicon nitride, on the other hand, is, is deposited. This is amorphous at the end of the day. And it can be deposited in multiple ways, right? Uh, you, can be, you can use silene um, and nitrogen uh, in the plasma to generate uh, uh, the silicon nitride, or you can use uh, dichlorosilane with uh, nitrous oxide to generate silicon nitride in a furnace, right? High temperature furnace. Uh, though we call you know, both as silicon nitride, but uh, st stoichiometry is very different. Uh, the ratio of silicon and, and, and nitrogen can be very different. So ideally, you you want uh, you know uh, Si three and four. So you need to have that right composition. If you don't have, then the problem starts. Right? Uh, not necessarily in the longer wavelength region. Primarily at the shorter wavelengths where. Silicon, if the silicon is rich, then uh, silicon is going to start absorbing. Okay, and that is what you see here, right? So this LPCVD is, is reasonably low loss, right? Comparatively, because the silicon content is I mean, close to stoichiometry, let's put it that way. However, the other recipe that we run, it has a lot of silicon uh, aggregates, right? And that absorbs in 780. This is, this, this, I mean, you need to look this at a certain wavelength. The context here is at what wavelength, right? So the losses are very high because silicon just absorbs. They are sitting there in the network and it starts absorbing. So what you want is silicon, silicon bar fitly there, right? Primarily you want uh, silicon nitrogen and all satisfied, no dangling bonds and so on that need not, uh, you know, uh, present there and start absorbing. So the whole idea is that. So the loss here, is, is is telling us, uh, you know, uh, the proportion of silicon and nitrogen uh, in the in the material, the bulk material. Correct, and the HNL uh, signifies the temperature, I assume. Correct, 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 correct. Yeah. So I hope that answers your question, Sujay. I, um, Something came up. Uh, yeah, I thought so too, but it, the chat: which chemistry is used for dry etching of silicon? Um, MK saying. Okay, dry edge for silicon. Um, so we use uh, uh, fluorine chemistry primarily um, for for silicon, both um, for shallow edge silicon and also deep edge silicon. Um, we use uh, fluorine based chemistry. Uh, C4F8 um, is, is traditionally used, uh, but we do have. Um, Slight, slight variation uh, in uh, in the precursors, but the chemistry is 
uh, fluorine based chemistry. Uh, however, my, in my personal experience, uh, you know, uh, bromine chemistry is much better. So if you have uh, access to bromine chemistry, I would use bromine uh, and oxygen chemistry. Uh, we do have bromine here, but for some historic reason, we are stuck with the fluorine. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, that's all from the audience, I suppose. Uh, you can still type in while the panelists sort of chimes in a little bit. So, Vijay or Arnav, do you guys have any questions? Yeah, Sankar, uh, it's a very nice talk. I think uh, you cover many things, and I'm delighted to see that you are just trying a lot of exotic materials. Yeah, which which uh, normally it is difficult to get access in uh, normally uh, whatever CMOS foundry is offering today. So uh, yeah, hopefully if things uh, uh, goes better, I think it will be adopted in CMOS foundry, no doubt about it, uh, for better characteristics. I think uh, that's a good uh, that's a good comment. And another thing, uh, I was just considering that uh, when you. Uh, normally, uh, you know, silicon uh, in silicon germanium photo detector normally people use, and you are uh, showing that uh, speed up in the order of some gigahertz, uh, tens of gigahertz, right? Uh, Correct. Yeah, that, is, that, that is true. Mm, silicon detector you have used, Correct. but uh, I think. Uh, Probably uh, not normally silicon uh, germanium photo detector would be much uh, better, right? And uh, why not same technology adapting here? Whatever normally in foundry is used, when foundry normally using. Yeah. Why? So uh, you know th there are there are uh, two verticals here, right? So one is you you have a silicon uh, platform that is uh, that is operating at uh, let's say. Um, above band gap, which is, you know, 1550 uh, range, let's say, right? Less than 1600, uh, where, uh, you know, germanium could, could help you, right? So if you put germanium, you can get reasonably good um, uh, responsivity and also speed as well. So you, mm -hmm. in principle, you can push at this point of time to about 50, 60 gig, right? Mm -hmm. So that is what you can do with germanium where on, on on top of silicon, right? Uh, there are there are two things to it, right? So that technology comes uh, with whatever process technology requirement uh, or process requirement in order to get the right junction. Right? If you don't get the junction right, then you have trouble. Okay, uh, there is no point in having germanium, so you, you will not get uh, the speeds that you want. Okay, so that is one challenge that you have with using that technology, right? What we are actually doing is not detecting 1550. We are looking at lower wavelengths. So we are looking at 850, 780 uh, range, uh, where silicon nitride is the platform that we use uh, for all kinds of passives and actives. And there we use uh, silicon as a detector there, right? So the idea there is to uh, find a suitable detector, you know, below 1100, let's say, right? So below 1100 range. And uh, above that, you can, you know, still get access through the, the germanium uh, process. But I don't, I think people will move towards integrated silicon detectors uh, once the germanium, uh, sorry, silicon nitride platform matures. Uh, and the lower wavelength, uh, you know, circuitries mature and the application space expand, uh, okay. similar to 1550. The reason why we have not done that germanium is, uh, is that one is the access. I mean, I should say that we have not completely, uh, you know, shied away in doing that. We, we, we recently have demonstrated that you can get germanium on, sil on SOI, uh, amorphous germanium, do liquid phase epi and we have demonstrated responsibility photo current we have done but not made any decent let's say you know uh, 
high speed uh, detectors or even responsivity for that matter. Okay. Uh, going forward, we might attempt to uh, get germanium uh, detectors because we are in the process of developing uh, germanium epi on silicon uh, and also germanium epi for or silicon germanium epi for other applications. So we may attempt to do that, but I think there is already enough work done on that domain. So I don't see what value we could add there, uh, but I see the silicon integration uh, in nitride for lower wavelength, that's still rich. And that's, that's oh, where yeah. I, I was coming yeah, from. That's a, that's a good point, actually. No, my, my uh, other point is associated to that. Uh, uh, what limits that because you know silicon germanium we see that now in the IMEC they are giving 50 gigahertz and uh, I know that they are using some traveling wave type of long waveguide uh, structures yeah and it's, a, it's basically an interdigitated uh, pull out right correct, yeah. um, correct. so that, uh, you 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 can much efficiently pull out the carrier so at the end of the day you don't want to be you know transit time limited so uh, that architecture helps you to do that. Oh, correct. So same architecture in silicon diode also uh, can yes. give you also similar uh, frequency. Yes. Yeah. yes, absolutely, absolutely. I think uh, I think uh, I don't see any other obstacle for that. Yeah. Absolutely, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. okay, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, I am done. Uh, yeah. So. Okay. Uh, okay. I, uh, okay. There was actually a question that just came in. Um, so Shankar, if you can comment a little bit on. Um, the loss okay. the, the loss while su switching from amorphous GST um, to crystalline challenge with GST based devices how to deal with that <laughs> so you know um, so so GST is not really a great material I'll, I'll, I'll go back to 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 the slide what uh, Piyush is pointing uh, da -da -da. Okay, so I think VO2, right? So, okay. Uh, da, da, da. Ah, here it is. I did not, actually, I did not, you know, uh, show this at all, I think. <laughs> but I, I, I think he knows that we work on GST. <laughs> all right, so, uh, you know, this is this is where it all started, right? We did something with VO2, right? Um, and uh, And this is what you see, uh, you know, as a function of voltage, uh, as I showed you, right, uh, with with the wavelength shift, you also get loss. Okay, this is VO two, where your uh, imaginary part of the refractive index, right, is still a non-zero, right. You, you you don't want that. Okay, ah here, so you want to make sure that you 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 get a material system where uh, your absorption is low. Okay. So GST, unfortunately, uh, you cannot have, uh, you know, zero um, uh, K, right, or zero extinction. It always comes with absorption, um, amorphous to crystalline transition. However, if you can dope GST with, you know, uh, like say selenium doping, right? Uh, so selenium doping could help you to reduce this uh, this absorption, right? The K can be reduced. Um, however, that comes with uh, the delta N compromise, right? So you can reduce the uh, absorption, but your real part, right, uh, of, of 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 your change also will get compromised. Okay, so. You need to work with with the material if you really want to just use GST. Uh, that's going to be a challenge. Okay, uh, but in some cases you want this phase change with um, absorption change, right? You can store this as a as a uh, you know kind of memory, right? As intensity as a memory. In in some cases people do uh, uh, use it, particularly in neuromorphic type applications. Uh, where the weights can be actually coded as absorption, okay? Um, while the phase is not going to be really of use 
if you want to store it okay um, so people use it in that context however if you want a pure you know uh, uh, phase change without any absorption you need to look at other platforms um, like antimonide selenide antimonide sulfide so those are all coming up and even just very thin full antimonide i think there was an interesting paper from uh, um, harish's group um, uh, uh, recently uh, that showed you know a very thin layer i think it was 5 nanometer or so uh, that exhibits um, uh, phase change however if you go beyond 10 or 15 then it shows bulk character so there is no phase change so you need to look at some other material system if you want to completely avoid loss however in some of the applications uh, we actually want loss right for coding purposes all right um i have a couple of questions myself um yeah. one was uh, the vibrometer um on the mems cantilever you showed us some phase measurements i i guess i missed the part where the instrument actually gives us both amplitude and phase so um, so so this is this is what you're talking about yeah, right? yeah. Uh, can you explain how you yeah. measured the blue curve yeah so if you look at it this is a lock-in measurement right at the end of the day ah, okay right so you are driving it through uh, uh, uh through this uh you know uh, drive here with the dc if you want it or not uh, and the optical signal goes through the detector and then the locking decodes that right so okay. once it goes through the locking then i i think that yeah, you are basically, basically getting both amplitude and phase yeah, from the lock in the yeah. yeah thank you thank you um and then the second one is yeah using silicon for visible is, is a fantastic idea but yeah. did you use them in the avalanche uh, region? Like, have you tried biasing harder to? <laughs> no, we, we we haven't. Uh, so you know, this this is um, a simple MSM configuration that we tried, and it worked reasonably well, right? And uh, right now we are trying to push this with different configuration uh, to 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 see um, how to induce gain and also how to get the speed going so we haven't that pushed it to uh avalanche region okay. and we do yeah, see that data. Data. i mean if you push it you can we can really see it but then you know uh, the student is scared that <laughs> he needs it for something else so he we did not push it beyond for that particular experience got it, got it. Yeah. yeah no i think it's interesting because silicon is also known to have a pretty good k yeah. factor okay. yes yes it's yes. nice to be produced uh, so that's I have yeah. one more question. Sure, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Shankar, uh, so yeah. I want to, uh, can you just uh, put up your that slide which when uh, this uh, silicon modulator, you just uh, doped and uh, doping region, intrinsic region, and all those things, combination you are using to get certain advantages. Right. I could not follow that completely. If you have just quickly, if you can just sum up once again that one. Yes. Uh, this one correctly yeah so yeah. yeah so if you look at um um you know there are there are different ways of improving the bandwidth i did go you know re reasonably quick here because it's it's reasonably loaded <laughs> in terms of things um so if you look at uh, the ways of improving um you know the bandwidth or rather uh, the speed um one way to look at is uh is to look at the device configuration itself Okay, this is something that you can do, right? So you can make reasonably high Q cavities, right? Um, yeah. Where the transition can be very high, right? Uh, but the only problem there is your dynamic range is going to suffer because you, you need to compromise something, right? So you can have reasonably high Q, uh, but in the configuration that you have, you will not have enough extinction to work with, right? So it's, it's going to be a uh, competition between uh, the speed and, uh, uh, you know, modulation extinction that you want, okay? So you can do uh, Q factor improvement. The other thing that you can use, of course, RC, you need to carefully design uh, uh, the contacts and, and, and how you are going to take it out, right? Uh, 
so you know that that's that's basically what you uh, what you get and finally uh, it comes down to the capacitance right so r is okay but capacitance is something that you need to manage very efficiently all right mm -hmm. Uh, it, 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 it need to be managed in such a way that you you can efficiently uh, pump the charges in and out, right? At the same time, don't induce, uh, you know, huge loss into the system, right? <clears throat> because the natural uh, 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 way of doing this is, okay, I will, I will just take, instead of P and N, I will just uh, go for P plus and N plus, uh, that should give me enough, uh, you know, carrier uh, to push the modulation. But then, the the, the modulation can be, uh, I mean, the depth can be increased, right? But then you are you are going to push the whole noise floor down, okay? Because the overall absorption will increase, right? So, <clears throat> the way to improve it, people have done it in different ways, right? So, that's why we I have put these two, right? The central one is the obvious one where you know you have the junction at the center and you yeah. have you have the equal you know uh, uh, field on both the arms but then that's not the best way to do it right the reason for that is um, if you go back and look at the the dispersion equation right your contribution of holes to n effective is larger than the electrons okay so that's why you know uh, when, when Krishnamurti was there in the Oracle, they, they, they had this very nice way of doing this, right? They have shifted it and found that the offset geometries are going to give you much better uh, uh, modulation efficiency compared to, you know, junction at the middle, okay? So that we understood, okay, fair enough. But again, the problem here is your absorption losses are going to be increased, right? So modulation depth is going to be a problem, right? Or, or rather, the total loss is going to be a problem. And there, the speed comes in, right? So, if I want to improve the speed, okay, let's look at the capacitance, right? So, you, you can always uh, improve the capacitance by looking at the junction and, you know, that is what, uh, you know, uh, in the bottom architecture that you have. Instead of PN, you just use PIN. That will give you very high speed. Right? right, you can you can quickly move, right? But then the problem there again is you can move faster, right? Uh, but then the depths are going not going to be very minimal because you cannot get all those charges going because of the very large intrinsic region there, mm -hmm. because the overlap of the charges are or, or the number count of the charges in the intrinsic region are going to be low. Okay, mm -hmm. so you can move fast, but the amplitude or the depth is going to be small so these are all competing requirements right so i want high speed and also i want high modulation depth so there should be some way to compromise but if you look at the uniform distribution right what people have done is they have taken this cross section and made a ring or a waveguide right took this cross section made a ring or just a, a waveguide or or max center right so you know, uh, Vadiru was actually designing this and we thought, okay, why don't we look at profiled, you know, doping, okay? Mm -hmm. Let's look at the profile doping and this profile doping design is not easy uh, because you need to understand the diffusion uh, uh, length of these dopants because the diffusion length for NNP are different, right? The dopants are very different. So we need to design it in such a way that these, uh, these, these these margins are met so that you will have a PN junction here, right? And then a PIN junction here, all right? Yeah. So the junction itself or, or the ring, the modulator itself has both PN and also PIN, right? Mm -hmm. And also this offsetted geometry, right? Along with this offsetted. So we put all these concepts together Right, in order to come up with uh, a that will help us. Sankar, I don't see any difference when you just change your offset or gap, but not much difference in your experimental result S21 measurement. Yeah, that's actually what you want, 
right? Because when you when you talk, what is dominating is what you want to know. Because this offset, the effect of offset, right? You want oh. this offset to be minimal effect on the overall performance. If I if I have a huge difference between fifty and hundred, then my margin is very low. Okay, I do. I, I need fifty nanometer alignment accuracy between the two different layers. That is that is too much uh, ask for the. This litho is done in uh, in two forty eight. So there the alignment accuracy is more than fifty nanometers. Okay, so that's where it comes. Two forty. You just I see that MPW run. It's two forty eight. No, there are layers that is done in two forty eight. I see. Okay. There so, are certain uh, layers that you do in two forty eight. And there are certain layers that you do one. I think Sudarshan will allow me just 30 seconds more here. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing, uh, do you have any uh, mod, uh, have you uh, done any model or uh, just uh, just trying experimental first? And one thing is that I see that first equation you put forward, that uh, uh, bandwidth limitation, or what about the yeah. calculation Q dependent and RC dependent. Right. I I don't think that Q dependency uh, that is very uh, fast basically. I think uh, I even whatever Q is there, that okay. is I think uh, in the order of picosecond, right? Uh, something less than that, I guess. So I think mostly it is uh, RC uh, limited. Is that is not it, or you you think that FQ is also no Q? Actually, you you take intrinsic Q, right? So what you what you normally take is you just uh, have the passive Q, but that's not what we should use. So this this Q should be loaded Q that takes into account the absorption loss in the system, right? Okay. So okay. so okay. then uh, the, the the tau that is not intrinsic a uh, tau, but this takes into account the junction as well. Mm. Okay, 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 thank you, Shankar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's one. Thank you, Shankar, for patiently answering all the questions and staying yeah. with us uh, almost an hour after yeah. uh, five o'clock. So, um, yeah, I really appreciate the style of talk. Uh, we tried to gather uh, most uh, people. Uh, people's attention, right? Uh, I think you've covered basics and you've gone into some of the most recent results. So I think you've given the full flavor. Um, and I think a lot of the audience members are also um, very aware that uh, there's a tonic integrated course <laughs> from both you and Vijay on NPTEL, right? And I'm sure that there are a lot of people uh, from that group who are also attending these things. So I really thank uh, your work in general. Uh, you're, we are all rooting for silicon photonics. I know it's a very small crowd, but uh, <laughs> hopefully uh, we can grow the crowd. Yeah, we are time. growing. Uh, we have to. We are for getting you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have to grow. Uh, yeah. So thanks again, and uh, yeah, hopefully uh, you can join us for some of the future CPU Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely, looking forward. Yeah, and yeah, hopefully we can invite you on campus uh, sometime soon as well. All right, cool, cool, good. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. Very much and uh, have a nice evening, a week. Yeah. Meet you all soon sometime. I'll bring it over to uh, Deep Trish. Okay, good. Comment here. Yeah. 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 yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Selfraja, for this wonderful presentation and this nice work and uh, thank you professor uh, sudarsanan uh, for nicely handling handling our q and a session and uh, thank you all the participants for your active uh, involvement so i hope to see you all in our next webinar in august yeah. so have a nice evening so next speaker will be from industry uh, pradeep uh, srinivasan so that will be in the August, yeah. Hopefully all of you will join. Thank you very much, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Sankar, once again. Thank you very much, take care. Thank you. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.